Hey, I'm Mark Peter Davis, serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, community organizer, and the author of a new book called The Fundraising Rules about how to raise venture capital. Uh, you can find out more about me at mp.me. But I'm going to dive right in today to the topic of things you need to know about fundraising. And obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I'm going to try to cover some interesting topics that might help a lot of you uh, achieve more success. So starting here with the title slide, the question you have to ask yourself in your fundraising process is, it, are, are you going to feel like the guy who's holding up the cashier, or are you going to feel like the cashier? And determining which side of the table you're going to be on in this transaction, whether people are seeking you and chasing you down in order to buy your equity, or whether you're bothering them to get them to invest, is going to be a function of how you structure your round and what strategies you use. I'm going to cover a lot of things in this conversation here, which will hopefully help you make sure you're the cashier and it feels like all the investors are chasing you. So first, a brief bit of background. I'm involved with a number of things. Uh, my primary focus right now is an organization called Interplay. You can check it out at interplay.vc. And we incubate, accelerate, and make angel investments in companies via that vehicle. I'm also a venture partner at High Peaks Venture Partners, a seed stage fund based out of New York. And as I mentioned before, I'm the author of a new book called The Fundraising Rules which is 230 pages of insight on the venture capital fundraising process. And it's really designed to be a handbook or manual that every entrepreneur can take with them as they navigate the fundraising process to provide clarity and insight as into what's actually happening step by step through the process. Let's dive in. So when I ask most entrepreneurs, what, is a what are the drivers of your returns? You typically hear answers uh, out of some business school case study, market size, competitive dynamic, the strategy of the business, etc. But very few people actually mention fundraising and how you structure your, your actual investment, what types of investors you take in, how you allocate capital to them and beyond can have a huge impact in your eventual ownership and, and payouts from the company. So getting your fundraising strategy right is probably as important as everything else you do in aggregate. But it's never mentioned in that list. So I think it's my call to action here is to focus on and think about how you're actually financing your company in a deep way to ensure that if you're an entrepreneur, you're maximizing your payout. So the first question people have is how much to raise. And I'm going to be relatively chronological on how I go through these slides. Uh, and so we're really working right now at the planning phase. The short answer on this is you should raise 12 to 18 months or 18 to 24 months of capital uh, for your company in your first, in kind of every round, but especially in your first round. And the simple logic is this: is that in order to raise your next round at an increased valuation to get a step up, you're going to need to have achieved milestones on the, op in the within the operations, whether that's launching a new product, acquiring customers, filling out the team. Whatever it may be, those milestones are going to tell the story that justify for future investors an increase in value. So in order to do that, you probably need 12 to 18 months because everything in business just takes a long time. And you have to assume six months to raise your next round of capital. Getting, getting on everyone's schedules can be slow, uh, and going through the process can take some time. So if you do the math, on the conservative side, you want to raise 18 months of capital in the aggressive 24 uh, and it's just important to figure out what, you know, what the right amount is for that. In order to do that actual calculation, you need to model out what you actually plan to spend to operate the business and look at the business conservatively with low estimates on revenue to ensure that you're raising enough cash to take you 18 to 24 months uh, in extreme cases without any revenue at all. So there are a lot of sources of capital out there. I'm going to focus on VC in this conversation. Uh, there are a number of other ways you can bring in capital. There's angel money, there are grants you can get from government organizations. Some more entrepreneurs will actually run services businesses, whether they're doing some sort of consulting or otherwise, to fund the underlying product company. And then obviously there's been the emergence of crowdfunding through a number of different platforms. But this, this talk here will be focused on engaging VCs. I think many of the lessons are, are directly transferable to the angel market but we'll be focusing on the VC market. So one quick tip, uh, and I've, I've had this question from a number of entrepreneurs, but if you're new to the game, it would be helpful just to know one basic thing. 
You can't give the money back once you take it from an investor and give them equity for it. If they invest via a debt vehicle, convertible note or otherwise, uh, the structure may allow you to repay them and take them off your cap table. But if it's an equity arrangement where they actually own a portion of the company after the transaction, you can't just kick them out when, when something goes wrong. So the first thing you need to do is just go into this with a mindset that you need to find partners and people that you actually want to interact with that you think will be helpful, and that won't drive you crazy. Uh, those are really, really important concepts to understand and kind of that's one of the highest orders of criteria for finding investors uh, if you have choices. So jumping into it here, on the VC side, you know, you have to ask yourself, is VC Pandora's box? There's big phrases that are thrown out by investors, go big or go home, uh, and there's a lot of truth in that language. So if you raise VC, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into and ensure that it's aligned with your goals. And the reason why I emphasize this slide and the next one coming up is because many entrepreneurs that I meet just assume venture capital is the right path for them. It's not always. And so the key is to understand if your business is truly a fit for venture capital. And that's a function of a couple things. So let's dive into that. So this is something called the fundraising strategy matrix that I built a few years ago that I think will be helpful for a lot of people to at a high level make a decision about how they should finance their company. So focusing on the y-axis on the left side here first, the scalability of the, business, of the business. And you've got huge at the top and small at the bottom. And in the bottom uh, axis, the x-axis, you've got low capital intensity and high. So you have to ask yourself, you know, where you fit on this matrix. Are you going to be a big company that doesn't require much cash to get there? Or do you need a lot of cash to be a big company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So let me now take you through the what this two by two structure here tells you. So starting with the most obvious, if you're going to build something in the bottom right, which is a very small business that takes a lot of capital, you might want to reconsider and, and see if there's not a better idea out there. So that may be an unviable business model. Okay, Moving one to the left here in the bottom left, if you have a relatively small business opportunity, something, you know, sub a hundred million dollar market, and you don't need a lot of capital to do it. You may want to try to figure out if there's angel or bootstrapping strategies for financing the company. Some of the options I mentioned before, doing services or consulting, getting grants, Kickstarter, or other crowdsourced, uh, crowdfunding campaigns, etc. Um, if you end up in the top right, skipping the upper left for a second, which is you've got a big company that needs a lot of capital to get there, then it, the path is pretty easy. You probably want to go the institutional route and get venture capital where you can get invest investors with deep pockets who can provide you with capital for future rounds and really support the business through its growth. If you're in the unique situation where you have a really, really big opportunity and you don't need a lot of capital to get there, and this is increasingly uh, increasingly frequent scenario, especially in the IT space as capital requirements have declined, you have to ask yourself a different question, and that's really around what your barriers are. If you've got huge barriers through a network effect or even a patent or something else that really makes the company incredibly defensible, you may want to consider bootstrapping it, position yourself to own more of the company uh, while still realizing this big opportunity. If you have lower barriers, and this is really you know, a gold rush situation, a land grab, where you've got to go out and hustle and beat the competitors to the market, you might find yourself thinking, hey, it's a better strategy to go out and raise a bunch of money, make sure we exploit this opportunity and not miss it, not be greedy about the equity that we own because it's such a big opportunity to begin with. So that's the basic thinking in this two by two matrix. I would recommend everyone spends a few t minutes studying this before they proceed down a fundraising path to make sure that they are in the right quadrant to, and to ensure that they're aligned with the, with the capital that they're going to raise. Here's why it matters so much. Let me give you a couple of bad scenarios. If you end up raising venture capital but have a very small business opportunity and you talk a few VCs and investing, you could find yourself in a situation where you're really taking a lot of risk in the company. So let's say your company plateaus at a $5 million top line, you've raised venture capital. Depending on who your partners are, they may or may not be comfortable with you selling the company. And in that scenario, uh, you could be raising even more money and getting further diluted to pursue riskier business endeavors like launching new products or other things that may not have been core to what you initially set out to do and may carry with them a lot of risk. So this is a scenario where you can really dilute down 
uh, your ownership in the extreme, and you probably won't benefit from the same upside uh, at an exit, even if it is a small exit, because you'll, you'll have different covenants and restrictions by having taken venture capital money. If you've got a small opportunity, or a, excuse me, a very large opportunity, and you choose to bootstrap or, or raise just angel money, and angel money can be great as a precursor to venture, but if you only stay in the angel path and raise relatively few dollars, um, you may give other, you may put the idea in market and allow other people who are better capitalized to, to run by you and actually conquer the market and take over the opportunity and put you out of business. So those are the two extremes where being misaligned with your fundraising strategy can be really bad. And as I said early on in this, in this presentation, really ensuring that you've got a fundra fundraising strategy aligned to what your business is actually going to achieve is critical for maximizing the entrepreneur returns, the entrepreneur payout. So take a few minutes to study this. I'm going to go ahead and move on here with the presentation. Common question, early days. A lot of people raising their seed round debate whether or not they should do a debt or an equity round. Just so folk, for folks who aren't familiar, convertible notes are a pretty common structure early on in the company. They're also used later on as bridge, bridge uh, vehicles to get people with a smaller amount of capital to the operational milestones to be able to raise the next big venture round. But they're, they're very often used uh, in early days for an angel or a seed round before the Series A. And so you as an entrepreneur have to decide whether or not you want to take a convertible note for your seed round or you want to do an equity round. And there's a lot of pros and cons. So for a debt round, you get to kind of defer, to, if you do a convertible note, you get to defer the valuation and defer the terms. You really just agree to give the current, the people who invest in the note, uh, the terms that are determined by a future investor. And this is a lot easier to process. Legal fees are smaller. The documentation's lighter. It's just a much lower friction way to go. On the equity side, uh, you have the benefit of getting all the governance in place. You set up a board usually. You create rules about how decisions are made in the company. And you really clean the organization up so when you get to your next round of financing, the next investor can come in and know that everything's been tidied up and there's less work to do. And that can, take, that can make the next process a lot more seamless. In my mind, those pros and cons really wash out. There's not really enough incentive in either of those arguments to pick a, a convertible note or an equity round. But there is a way to think about it, and there is a reason to pick one or the other, assuming you do have a choice and your investors don't have a strong preference. And that's the market for terms and valuation. So the, the market for venture capital and the entrepreneur payouts fluctuates. There are periods where the market's hot and you get better valuations and better, and better control provisions, things that are more favorable to the entrepreneur. And there are terms where there's periods where it's not that hot and the terms aren't as great. The way I think about this is the convertible note allows you to defer locking in the deal and the equity round locks it in today. So if you think the market stinks, you are better off getting a convertible note in place and hoping that you're going to raise your next equity round in better days. If you think the market's hot right now and maybe overhyped, then you're better off locking in with an equity deal. That's it. Hopefully that helps you make that decision. There's one dynamic that can really put entrepreneurs on their heels through the negotiating process and through the fundraising process, and that's access to capital. If you're running out of money and the business is about to go under, you'll be more inclined to take a less favorable investment from VCs or angels or otherwise because you're desperate. So one thing I recommend a lot of entrepreneurs do is make sure they have enough cash for at least a six-month process for raising capital when they go into it. And if they don't, I often suggest they do a two-step, which is take a convertible note for enough money, a small amount, but enough to get six months out, and then they go out and raise the the venture angel round uh, and run that process slowly, appropriately to ensure that they get a good economic deal. So when you go out to raise, there's really only three docs you need to get the deal done. And this is in addition to anything you use internally to run the business. But the core three docs are pretty simple. They are an executive summary, which usually should just be one page, a 10 to 20 slide deck, PowerPoint presentation, and an operating model. So let me run through each of those really quickly. So an executive summary should just basically have the bait, the stuff that should tell a VC or an investor that your business is a fit for their investment criteria. 
And that means you don't need to explain the entire company in one page. It's okay if an investor reads your one page document and doesn't know exactly what you do or how you do it. What they need to know is it's a geographical fit, it's a stage fit, your capital situation makes, it, makes you a fit for investment as well. Uh, and they need to roughly understand the sector and the pain point and the solution to get excited enough to take a meeting. But the executive summary is really just bait. It doesn't have to be a complete answer, like a completely informative to an investor. And when entrepreneurs fall into the pattern of trying to explain everything into a one-page summary, uh, they, they have a lot of trouble making it short enough to, be, to kind of really engage an investor in a quick and easy way. And so that's why you want to try to keep it to one page. But the way you do that is you make sure that you're only saying enough to, you understand that the hurdle here is just to make it interesting and to show people it's a fit, not to explain everything. When you get into a meeting, you're going to show a 10 to 20 slide deck. Uh, the deck should follow a uh, typical cadence, which I'll go through in a minute. Uh, and that cadence should explain kind of the high level of the business. You're not going to explain every nuance or detail of the operation, but you should be able to explain the market, kind of the, the competitive landscape, the pain point, the solution, etc. So someone comes away with a pretty good 80-20 understanding of what you're doing. And then, you know, all of the details of how you do it, what's happened with the business to date, the story uh, of all the challenges you faced will be left outside of the deck and done verbally or through other conversations. And the last thing that I, that I think you need is an operating model. And note, I'm not saying a financial model. This isn't about accruals or any fancy accounting. An operating model is really just about explaining month by month what happens with the business, both from an operational perspective and from a cash perspective. So what I recommend entrepreneurs do is take one sheet of Excel, take it out 60 columns, one column is each month, and show how revenue comes into the business, how money gets spent, and what the net cash is at the end of each month. The key with this is to actually, through the numbers, explain how you're going to build the business. This is the how. And so the way you do that is, for example, at the revenue side, you'll say, hey, we're a marketing company. We're going to be using different marketing channels. Here's what we're spending per month on marketing. Here are all of the different conversion metrics we're assuming. And when you run all of that through the funnel, it generates this much revenue. Or if you're a sales organization, this is when we're going to hire people, and these are numbers in the Excel sheet. The number goes from one salesperson to two, so people can see when these decisions are, are made and implemented. How many calls a person makes a, in a given day, what the assumptions are around that, uh, the conversion rates, etc. Just really show the operating metrics and how they drive revenue. And then you do the same thing down below on the expense side. And when you put all of that together, this document should explain the details of the plan on how you, uh, of how you intend to build a business. Very powerful document. The key is to do less with it, but to show enough detail in the document where an investor can understand the assumptions that drive your projections. And if they believe the assumptions, then they can believe in the output, the projections themselves. I recommend people, when they put their, their PowerPoint presentation together, include an investment overview slide. So an investment overview slide is kind of like an agenda but it's a little different. And it does something special. In a world where investors, VCs, and otherwise are really busy, and their goal, frankly, is with, with the large volume of deals coming in, to get to know as quickly as possible all the deals they shouldn't be spending time on, they'll very often come into meetings, and if they don't feel like they're going to get the answers they need to make a quick decision, they'll start asking a lot of questions and potentially derailing the very important narrative that the entrepreneur wants to tell to kind of make their story come to life. What the investment overview slide does is it takes a typical agenda slide and it includes answers, not just topics. So instead of market size as a topic, you would say $2 billion addressable market as the bullet. And the magic in that is it does two things. One, since you have a series of topics there, if you have the right topics, you should be able to communicate to an investor that, hey, you're going to cover the things they need to hear. And that's what an agenda slide does as well. But you communicate it through this document as well. But if you provide the answers in addition to that in the actual text, you can tell the investor through one slide, we're probably a fit for your thesis or not. And if we're a fit, sit back, chill out, listen to the narrative, and you'll be able to tell me if you buy in to my assumptions to get us to, you know, to these conclusions that we're showing in the investment overview slide. If it, in some cases, this slide can really help smooth out a meeting Give comfort to the counterpart of the investor that you're going to show them what they need to hear. 
and allow you to get through your story in a pretty clear way. So what is that narrative? So here's a song and dance. I think most, most presentations, most PowerPoint, even executive summaries, usually follow a cadence like this or close to this. I think it's always important to start with the team. Uh, if you have the right team in place, it'll give credibility to everything you tell about the market, the pain point, the solution, and even the competition thereafter. Furthermore, if you have the right team in place, the narrative about the team should, should explain why you're building this company. Usually you're at some sort of job or had some sort of need that led to the creation of this, this, this company. Then you hit with the investment overview slide. You talk about the pain points, so what's wrong in the market, what are you, how are you solving it, and sometimes this takes a few slides to get all the details out, but you really want to be clear about what your solution is here. You talk about who else is in the market, how you're competing against them, and why you're better. Important to include that last point, why you're better. And then you get into revenue. How do you make money from a given customer? How many customers are out there? You multiply revenue times customer, a number of customers, and that should give you an addressable market. Key thing here, addressable market, my definition of it is, your market size if you captured 100% of the available revenue to you. So that may mean some customers aren't relevant, and you may have a different price point than other people already out there. So the addressable market is really a unique number to each company. And then you talk about your milestones to date, and you probably want to tail it off here with your fundraising expectations, what you're looking for in terms of capital. So what is the goal of the first meeting? And just very much like the executive summary, if you kind of if you, if you bookend your objective in the meet, of each of these stages properly, it's a lot easier to achieve them in a fixed amount of time. This first meeting might be 30 minutes or an hour, 15, in the extre 15 minutes in the extreme. You want to make sure you, have, you understand what the objective is and don't try to do too much. You just want to do, hit the goal. And the goal of the first meeting is simply to get the second meeting. The way venture funds operate is often they have multiple partners and they'll have one person meet uh, with each company, and if it's a fit, you will meet with more people in the company over time, in the investment firm over time. And the reason they do that is it saves them man hours. They only spend one man hour with you, and they can decide whether or not you're likely to be a fit, versus having an entire partnership spend an hour each looking at the initial presentation. So it's very important you go into this meeting, especially if you're very time constrained, understanding what the objective is. It's just to get to the second meeting. And that means all you have to do is make an investor understand at a high level this company is really a clear fit with their thesis and it's a really exciting opportunity. If you achieve those two things, you should move forward in the process. Now given that dynamic, you should be prepared to present the exact same content multiple times with each given firm. Unless they again only have one partner. So when you show up at your next meeting with the venture fund, you've already had one meeting and it went well and they invited you back for another meeting, Expect to present the exact same PowerPoint slides over start to, start to finish. And it will get really redundant for you and probably for the first person you met with. But it's important that each new partner that sees the business hears the entire narrative and gets really acclimated to the story and excited about it. Each meeting is a new, fresh sales pitch to a different partner of the firm. All right, there's a lot of don'ts. A lot of things you can do wrong uh, at this stage in the game. A couple basic things, just to, to flag some things that typically happen. Don't be late. If you bring a partner or co-founder, don't argue with them in the meeting. If someone says something you don't totally agree with, re reconcile it after. Don't ramble. You know, use up a lot of your time doing that. And you don't need to read from a script. This is much more of a conversation at this point. Yeah, you'll probably guide your narrative by slides. But if people ask questions, you'll move or bounce around. And you just need to be able to communicate openly with the person across the table. Don't make up answers. If you find yourself in a situation where someone has asked you something you don't know, saying to the investor, hey, that's a great question, let me come back to you on that, is a terrific response. It shows a level of humil humility and focus on getting things right rather than uh, raising questions about whether or not you made stuff up or accuracy later. And if, especially if you say something that ends up being wrong and the investors figure it out, it could damage your credibility. One other thing I recommend people don't do is math in their head. If there's a bit of math that they ask you to do that you hadn't done before, when the spotlight's on you, it's easy to fumble through numbers and get it wrong and look like an idiot. So take your time, say, hey, I'll come back to you with that number, or work through it together, but try not to do math in your head because it just very often comes out with the wrong number of zeros or something else, and it's awkward. So here's an important insight 
Fundraising is like dating. And when you think about the dynamics you create with the potential investors, it's important to understand this dynamic. And there's a couple of psychological things that make this true. So the first thing is that everyone has their own tastes. So if you've got the next Google, the greatest company on earth, and it's the greatest investment opportunity you think this investor is ever going to see, you will still probably get rejected by some people. And the reason why is because different investors and different people in life have different, a different sense of what makes things attractive. In the investment community at the high level, some people really care about team, others market, some barriers, some technology, some product. You may have some of those elements and not others, and so you're going to face rejection. And when you go out, set out on your fundraising process, you just need to be emotionally prepared for that. Now that said, one of the other uh, app comparisons to the dating market is that some things are universally more attractive. Bigger market size, stronger team, all of those things will inevitably appeal to more people. Now what you want to do from a psychological perspective, which is very parallel again to the dating world, is you want to essentially play to the fact that everyone wants to get what they can't have. So the key, philosophically or strategically, when you go into this process, is to remember that everyone wants to nab the hottie. They want to have what they can't get. So you want to try and be the really attractive person in the dynamic. And the way you do that, effectively, is that you do one really important tactic. You communicate to investors where you are in the process. So when one investor says to you, hey, we'd love to have you in for a partner meeting or we're thinking about giving you a term sheet, it's really important that you call the other investors or email them and communicate that you are advancing to the next level with another partner. And why this matters is because it does a couple things. One, uh, it ensures that the other people who aren't taking that step yet, uh, if they're excited about the company, they will, they will, it will motivate them to move forward and focus on, your, on, on the investment opportunity. You gotta remember, they're probably looking at 10 or 20 opportunities at a given time, and you're trying to stand out and get their attention. And they may have loved your company, but they might have gotten caught up with something else, and this will be a little bit of a catalyst to get them to move forward. But the second thing it does, which is really great, is it give, ensures that investors who are interested, but maybe not the, the fastest moving, uh, can stay at, at pace with the opportunity and potentially uh, stay in the game. Nothing's worse for a VC than finding out a company you met with a few months ago that fell off your radar uh, has raised capital from someone else and they never followed up with you. You want to stay in the game, you want to stay in the flow, so not only are you creating a little bit of fire to motivate people to move forward and drive the process, but also you're respecting investors by ensuring that they're aware of your stage and your progress and they have the best opportunity they can to be engaged and potentially participate in the investment opportunity. Okay, so let's say you've gotten a term sheet uh, or actually before the term sheet even, you'll probably start some diligence activities. You've got a lot of people interested. Just going to flag high level what these activities are and what your goals should be. So typical things investors will do is they'll do expert calls and those might be people who know the industry really well. Uh, they'll typically call um, different partners with your company. Uh, they'll t call customers. Uh, usually the best way to do this, the best investors will ask you for references customers they can speak to and they'll probably call would-be customers in their own Rolodex. Uh, they'll start doing a market sizing analysis. They'll probably run through your operating model. Uh, some will do that with you. Some will do it independently. Uh, and they'll do a lot of research in your competitive landscape. And that is, again, you know, investors do different levels of diligence, but this is kind of the typical tear sheet of investor diligence that they'll do. Now, your goals in this process are threefold. One, it's to increase interest, uh, to make sure they're getting the answers that tell the story that, hope that should be not only be truthful, but also that makes your business more attractive. Um, one, you also want to demonstrate how you interact with them, because after the investment, you're going to be working with them, and you want to show that you can be a team player. And lastly, this is a great opportunity to educate a future board member or investor about the industry, get them really smart, to ensure that when they invest, eventually invest, they can actually help you uh, by understanding a lot of the nuances of your business. Now getting dinged, it happens, everyone gets, everyone gets the no, as I mentioned before. You gotta understand that in the venture side, they typically invest kind of the gen generic stat, which is pretty close to true for most firms, in one out of 100 opportunities that they really spend time on. Uh, so the, the hit rate's really low, so you're probably gonna face this. Now there's three reasons conceptually why you might get dinged. One, an investor might not think you have a good business. 
might, might disagree and, and not believe that you have a good business. But even if they believe you have a great opportunity, a good business, there's two other reasons why they may not go ahead and participate in the round. One, it's not a good investment opportunity for them, uh, and that could be because the valuation is too high or some other terms in the arrangement. And the third is, uh, the, the third factor why you might get dinged here is just fit. If you're in the wrong sector, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you're probably going to have a tough time raising money from an IT investor, even if it's a great business and you're at the right stage of investment, the right valuation. So those are the three highest level things that can happen. There's a whole litany of other ways you can get dinged, but understanding that uh, those three things exist should make it a lot easier and more palatable to hear the word no, because you'll understand it's not all about you or the company personally. There's very often things that are nuanced and specific to the venture fund that prevent them from investing in your space. Now there's a great phrase that one of my mentors taught me a long time ago. It's this phrase that everyone loves to be first to be second. And so once you get a lead investor, you'll probably see an avalanche or a pileup of other investors participating. So what that phrase means, everyone loves to be first to be second, is that everyone, all the investors have a fear of missing out. They're, in the early stages in particular, they're participating in a market where there's a lot of uncertainty about the outcomes of any given company. Most of the best investors still have 30% of their companies go to zero. So there's, there's, there's a, a certain element of risk in this that is so high that when you receive the term sheet or the acknowledgement, or the, ver the validation from another investor, um, it's a huge signal to a lot of other folks that there's something here. Someone smart wants to put a term sheet down and wants to invest. Well, there must be something good about your business uh, that maybe they missed or didn't understand, or maybe it just validated all the things they believed but they were afraid to act on. So raising money very much feels like you're wandering through a desert, and all of a sudden after you're just about to die from dehydration, there's a flash flood. And so when you get that term sheet, be aware you're probably going to get an avalanche, and there's going to be a different dynamic when you call up a bunch of investors and say, hey, you know, we just received a term sheet, are you interested in following on or whatever else, uh, which will give you quite a bit of leverage. So it's an important dynamic to understand. And that said, finding yourself in that situation where you take advantage of the avalanche is, is a reasonable way to do business. Um, it's a reasonable way to uh, maximize the outcome of your negotiation. But there's another way to do this. And actually, the way I've done most of my deals personally is very much what I call the expression of love. It's a pretty funny term. Uh, but it, it's, it, I think it's a very applicable, uh, appropriate way to describe uh, a way to do a deal, especially at the early stages. And the expression of love is a mutual thing where an entrepreneur says to a VC, hey, I'm talking to a lot of people, but this just feels awesome. You're, you're the partner I want to work with. And if the VC reciprocates and says, you know what, this is a terrific company, I'd love to work with you, do you just want to do this? That's a great moment to get into a different dynamic, a different type of negotiation. And the way this works with me is when, when I have that moment and we both kind of say, hey, we want to work together, let's make this work. You get into a, a negotiating arrangement where both parties have already agreed to work together. And I, what I have found uh, in my own experience is that both parties come to the table with a little bit more flexibility and they can work through a term sheet without a painful negotiation. You know, very often negotiating a term sheet this way takes an hour or two, not days or weeks. Now, this means you're not going to go shop around and, and maximize your deal. And maybe you, gave, maybe you end up giving a little bit of valuation if you go this way but you'll have a great relationship and you'll probably make sure you get the terms that matter to you uh, and you'll get to work with a partner that you really want to work with, which at the end of the day is far more important than most of the things you're negotiating in the actual economic and control provisions deal. Okay, so you, you've got this term sheet in hand. You've had this expression of love or you've got someone who said to you, you know what, we're, gonna, we're interested. Let's make sure quickly and run through some, some topics here to make sure you understand how to think about the transaction. So starting off with venture math, most, most entrepreneurs are very focused on, uh, on valuation. Let's run through how to, how to do this math. And typically what people hear is the equation in the bottom left of this slide. Pre-money pre plus investment equals post-money. Just give some definitions there. Pre-money is the standalone value of the company before the investment. The investment is the actual value of the dollars being invested. So if you raise $5 million, you put $5 million in that number. Um, and the post is simply the sum of those two. So if the company was worth $5 million by itself, you raised five, the post money investment, the post money valuation is worth 10. 
And the way to think about that is that determines everyone's ownership after the deal. So the people who own the company beforehand, if it was a 10 million post and the company was worth five in the pre-money valuation, now own half the company. So they can take all of their all of their ownership percentages before and divide it by half. And the investment pool, the investors, whoever came in, all whether it's one or more, collectively also own 50% of the company in that scenario. That's not the way investors think about the actual calculation. And the reason why this is important to figure out and understand is because a lot of entrepreneurs are looking at this equation of pre-money plus investment equals post-money, and they're thinking, gosh, what is the pre-money valuation? I have no clue what my company is worth. You know, very often you don't have cash flows. In some cases, you don't have a product to market. There's no way to do any traditional valuation methodology to figure out what the company is actually worth. And so it's guesswork if you take it that way. Now, the thing is, it's easy for investors to figure out because they have a very different perspective on, on how valuation is done. To investors, your pre-money valuation is an output, not an input into the equation. So the two ingredients that go into the calculation are how much you're raising and how much dilution you're going to take in the deal. And so if you are raising $5 million, you're taking 50% uh, dilution. The post-money value is therefore $10 million. Just simple division there. And you subtract out the investment, $5 million, and it leaves you with the pre-money valuation. So investors, most investors, are not really focused on what your pre-money is by itself. What they're focused on is how much money are we putting in and how much of the company are we going to own for that capital. And once you start focusing on those two metrics too, it's really easy to get aligned and try to figure out how to negotiate the most appropriate deal uh, in, a, in a very efficient, easy way. So what are typical dilution ranges? And a lot of people are wondering this. And it really ranges. Uh, you know, it varies by kind of market dynamic and by the, the interest in the company, the attractiveness of the team, all of the different things that make an opportunity uh, hot or not. And so here's an inaccurate, unscientific, but kind of directionally correct uh, bell curve to give you a sense of where dilution typically lies. So for every given round, typically seed, series A, series B, series C, beyond, really, really hot companies that have a lot of interest might be as low as kind of a 10% dilution. Uh, the, the fat part of the bell curve is 20 to 30%. And if things aren't great and you're having a tough time raising, you might face more than 30%. And that just kind of gives you directional answer. Now remember, this is the dilution your company will take at every investment round, uh, most typically. So you have to, as an entrepreneur, ask yourself, how do these economics work out to make for pretty healthy payouts? And so this is, a, this is one scenario just to give you a sense of how it's supposed to work. So what's supposed to happen is your dilution, your ownership, in that first column there, own, declines over time uh, as you take on subsequent rounds of equity as a founder. Your valuation, hopefully, is increasing along the way. And so what it's doing is it's, it's increasing your implied value uh, as an individual. So your ultimate value of your asset, while it may be a smaller percentage, has gone up. So you can see here, you might have owned 25% on day one, and you know, four rounds later, only on 13%. But if the company is appreciated properly, you're going to have $8 million in asset value versus 1.3 initially. You can study this. Hit pause if you're interested in looking at the math and spending some more time with it. It's very simplified, but it shows you how things are supposed to work when they're going well. Now, one of the constructs in the industry that's confusing and most entrepreneurs don't understand is something called a participating preferred asset class. So participating preferred is a particular structure that gives the investors or the owners of the participating preferred certain rights. And what it does, it really gives them two rights that are really matter. One, they get to take uh, a liquidation preference, which typically is one times their initial investment, out of the company at exit before any, anyone else gets paid. So typically, it's if you, get, if you sell the company for $10 million, we invest in a million, I get my money back and then nine million gets distributed out to everybody else. That's the participating. And that's the preference. The participation is then after they've gotten their money back, the ability to participate in the rest of the payout based upon their ownership percentage. Okay? So there's two different pieces to the payout structure. So to take you through the math in kind of a really simple way, and again, this might be a good place to pause after I've run through the numbers because we're doing a little bit of math here verbally. Uh, I can give you a sense of kind of how, these, how the participating preferred works. 
um, by taking you through these three scenarios. So all three scenarios are the same in the top half here. Let's say you've raised $10 million. The liquidation preference multiple is 1x, which means the, the liquidation preference paid out at sale is one times the original investment, which is, again, $10 million. And to simplify things, let's assume there's one investor and one founder that each own 50%. So this is how things get paid out uh, down below. So if you sell the company for a million in scenario one, all of the money would go to the investors because they get every dollar that comes out of, of the exit until they get their money back. They get the first 10 million. And if there's less than 10 million, they get all of it. And so there's nothing that goes to common, the founder, and there's nothing that kind of goes to uh, any of the investors on the participation side. Scenario two, the exit pr proceeds are exactly 10 million. Again, all of that money would go to the investors. And then third scenario here, you can see you have a good exit, you sell the company for 100 million, 10 million comes off the top, goes to the investors. There's 90 million that goes to the common. The investors own 50% of the common. And so you can see they get 45 million and the founders get 45 million. So a couple takeaways from this. The investors, you know, obviously get the lion's share of the payout with really small exits. And the liquidation preference doesn't have a huge impact on the payouts when you get to big exits. And that's there for two reasons. One, to give investors downside protection, but two, also to align the incentives for entrepreneurs to ensure that if they take venture capital, again, they're usually committing to go for a big exit, they'll pass up on smaller exit opportunities if someone knocks on the door and offers to buy the company for $10 million because it doesn't, it's not a great return for the investors, it's not aligned well, uh, it, and it, it, this mechanism ensures that the entrepreneurs are also aligned with going bigger. So it's a good place to pause if you want to run through the numbers. Uh, I will note before uh, moving on that there's also, there's, uh, in VC money does not always go in as participating preferred. There is scenarios where it goes in as non-participating preferred, where typically the investor has the choice between taking a liquidation preference or participating as common, but not both together. So here's the thing. How do decisions get made in a company? This is a really important question and thing to understand. Uh, when you're going into a negotiation, because understanding this will change what you focus on. There's this fallacy of this 50% uh, equity ownership that some uh, less experienced entrepreneurs will really focus on. Uh, and it doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter is because there's actually four ways in which decisions get made in a company. And you have to understand what those are. And what you'll find is the, the least common scenario is actually uh, having a decision made by the shareholders where the 50% would actually matter. So the first and most common way decisions are made is actually by the CEO. And that includes all day-to-day -day decisions, things that don't meet a certain threshold of significance that would merit them being bubbled up to the board. So the board then is the second line of defense. Bigger decisions around issuing, issuing options, uh, making hiring decisions, and other things typically are approved by the board uh, which in most, in most cases is some mix of investors and, and the founders and the management team. And, and very often an independent person as well. Now there are preferred decisions. There are some things that investors will carve out most typically and say, all right, the board, the board has to approve these certain types of decisions, but they can't, even if the board approves it, if it doesn't include the vote of the board member or board members who represent the investor class, these things cannot be approved. And so there are some things that typically get negotiated into a term sheet that give investors veto rights over certain provisions at exit, or not at exit, on a day-to-day -day basis. Even if the board approves it, you still have to have the preferred approve it as well. So it requires both of those things to take action. And the things that get approved by the shareholders are very rare things. You, you don't have a lot of day-to-day -day decisions, and certainly not most board-level decisions, that are farmed out to the whole shareholder class. You can imagine the complexity and the difficulty of chasing down people who maybe invest in the company five years ago and haven't been involved with it since uh, to get them involved in the decision-making process. Now, there are some things that do require that, but they're very rare. And because they're very rare, uh, it really makes this concept of 50% ownership far less important. Now, you want to obviously own more just for the economic reasons, but from a control standpoint, it's really less important. What every entrepreneur should be focusing on is what decisions are made by the board and what decisions are made by the investor class 
uh, where they have a veto right over any board decision. Those are the things that are really worth focusing on. After you do the deal, you got to remember um, that you've gone through this whole process and hopefully you're able to manage it in a way where everyone felt mutually respected because when it all ends, this person who's invested in your company, the representative for the venture fund, is now your new partner and they really are your partner. And if you pick the right people, uh, that they'll have the right mindset. And there are really two mindsets out there. Some VCs feel that uh, you work for their money and therefore to a certain extent they are your boss. Others you know, look at it and say, hey, we, you know, we're minority owners, we own less of the company very often than the founders do, uh, and we're their partner in the business and we want to help them build it. So you have to make sure you pick investors, if you have choices, that really understand the partnership mindset, that they're helping you build this company uh, in order to ensure you get that great dynamic. And if you don't have a choice and you're taking someone who believes they're going to be your boss, you just need to go in with eyes wide open and make sure you manage the control provisions, the way the syndicate, the way that uh, the term sheet is constructed and negotiated to uh, minimize the impact of that perspective. But no matter who you end up with, you're going to be working with these people and you need to really focus on concept of respect. I believe this is super important in business in general. Uh, I believe everyone deserves your respect, whether they're your partners, your investors, your employees, your service providers or beyond. It's just the right way to do business. So when you're going through this very difficult, emotionally challenged process, try to keep your head clear and remember that longer term, uh, paying respect now will ensure that you have healthy relationships later. And by the way, it's just the right thing to do. That's the, that's the most of the stuff here with this talk. I wanted to make everyone aware that I just put out a book. It's called The Fundraising Rules. It's getting a lot of attention uh, from the startup community. Uh, you can follow the link at the top, mpd.vc slash TFR for the fundraising rules, uh, BK for book, TFRBK, and that'll take you to my blog where you can channel through and purchase it electronically or get the paper version. And the fundraising rules is 230 pages of detail uh, that goes through the entire fundraising process chronologically, chapter by chapter. So there's chapters that focus initially on how the venture market works. Then it goes on to things like how to prepare your materials, how to get the first meeting, what to do in the first meeting, what to do after the first meeting what to do in the second meeting, how to handle the diligence process. And it's written in a way where it's designed to be a handbook, where you read it once and you're, you'll hopefully be a heck of a lot smarter about what VCs are thinking about and how the process works, and hopefully it should make all of the very opaque uh, venture process very transparent. But it also is structured in a way where it's very easy to flip to page 63 and find the answer you want, just reading a page or two when it's relevant. So you can find that it's out there, uh, and I'd love for you guys to buy it, check it out, send me comments. Uh, let me know what you think about it. And you can always find me at my blog, mpd.me, where I write about a lot of operational and fundraising finance uh, topics for startups. And you can follow me on Twitter at MPD. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to interacting with a lot of you soon.